Hello, everyone. And a heartfelt welcome to uh, the Human Brain Project um, TN slide by the Students um, Education Program. Can you all hear me and see me? Right now, there are some slides being presented how to use this WebEx program. Um, before we get started, I'll note that we will move to Zoom uh, for the next um, event. Um, and you can basically go in and see all the attendees um, to the right. So essentially, um, this um, TN Slide session is the second session that we've uh, tried out. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, we hope, of course, that you will uh, uh, attend many, many more and perhaps present your own work for us. Um, I am here as a host uh, to uh, guide you into the format. I can tell you that um, we'll have roughly 40 minutes, so keep it brief. Uh, there'll be two um, talks of 10 minutes duration each. Following each talk, we'll have room for a single uh, brief question, but I would like to leave the bigger questions for the Q&A session after the talk, and that will be roughly 20 minutes where we can discuss further in depth. And hopefully you can also <clears throat> reach out to the researcher individually if you have further questions uh, to continue the conversation. So I am... Um, of course, pleased to host this event. I'm also very pleased um, to, as a computer scientist of training, be uh, in the um, minority for once. So my name is Jens Johan Peterson. I'm a PhD student in uh, Sweden, Stockholm. I am uh, honored to uh, invite two speakers. They are both from uh, FZI Jülich, so the Forschung Centrum in, in Germany. Uh, Miriam Mentel and uh, Sandra Diaz uh, Pierre. They will um, reveal the topics themselves. Um, I'll just say that if there are any technical issues, you can reach out to the email on screen, education at human brain project. Um, if you have any questions, post them in a Q&A session to the right. There, there were slides being showed before. Um, this uh, will be recorded and you can find the recording and the slides in the education programs uh, e-library, which is linked in the bottom of the slide here. So without further ado, I'd like to um, hand it over to Miriam. And we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? No, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, hello everyone. I'm glad you joined the session today. Um, yeah, I'm working at the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine in Munich, and today I'd like to present you a technique that we've recently developed. Uh, we measure the scattering of the light to reconstruct nerve harbor crossings in the brain. Yeah, and unfortunately, my webcam is not working with this conference system, but I still try to uh, my best to make it look like a real video conference. So enjoy. Yeah, so far in our lab in uh, Jülich, we use a technique called 3D plus light imaging. Maybe you already heard about it. So we place uh, histological brain sections between a pair of linear photovices and a quarter wave retarder. And when we rotate these filters, we observe sinusoidal changes in the transmitted light intensity for each image pixel. And uh, the phase and the amplitude of the signal give us information about the uh, 3D orientation of the nerve fibers in the brain section. And uh, the reason why we obtain these signals is that most nerve fibers are surrounded by a myelin sheath, which is uh, highly birefringent. And with the setup here, we measure the orientation of the optic axis. And these orientations are then encoded in different colors. So with uh, 3D PLI, we reconstruct the nerve fiber orientations in 3D with microscopic resolution. So with a much higher resolution than comparable techniques like diffusion MRI, but uh, 3D PLI has also big problems when it comes to crossing nerve fibers. And to demonstrate this, you see here uh, two optic tracks that we placed uh, manually on top of each other. So we actually get a model system of two crossing nerve fiber bundles with a defined crossing angle. And when we now look at in-plane fiber orientations reconstructed by 3D PLI, we see that we only obtain a single fiber orientation for each measured tissue voxel. And uh, here in the region with the crossing fibers, 
um, yeah, the fab orientations cannot be correctly reconstructed. In uh, simulation studies, we modeled the propagation of the light through artificial fiber constellations, and then we looked at the uh, light behind the sample. We found that, uh, yeah, in the resulting scattering pattern, so the distribution of the light on a uh, hemisphere projected onto the XY plane, um, yeah, that it gives us additional information about the tissue substructure like the fiber crossings. Scattering of light for different fiber configurations, and we found that the light is always scattered perpendicular to the fiber orientation. So when we have crossing fiber bundles, we can determine the crossing angle from the scattering pattern. And these are all in plane fibers. When the fibers point out of the section plane, uh, these peak, uh, two peaks here and the scattering pattern merge. So when we measure these scattering patterns, we can reconstruct the nerve fiber crossings in brain tissue. And recently, I visited the lab of Silvania Pereira at the University of Delft, and they perform so-called uh, coherent Fourier scatterometry, usually on non-biological samples. And we had the idea to adapt this to measure the scattering in brain tissue. So in the simulation, we use a normally incident plane wave. So we illuminate the brain section by a non-laser light with a beam diameter of about a millimeter defined by the pinhole, and then we place a camera in the back focal plane of the lens. So we measure the Fourier transform of the image plane. And this is basically an image of the scattering pattern here. And because of the numerical aperture of the objective lens, we can only measure the inner circle of the scattering pattern. And here you see again, for the um, two crossing optic tracks, the measured scattering pattern for this region here. And here, the same for three crossing fiber bundles. And you see the measured uh, scattering patterns correspond very well to the simulated ones. And you can even see the different orientations of the fiber bundles in the pattern. Um, to evaluate these patterns, we integrate from the center to the outer border, starting on top and then moving um, clockwise. Then we obtain these line profiles here. And you see the peaks nicely show the orientation of the crossing nerve fibers in the sample, but with this technique, we um, a small region. So we have to perform a lot of measurements to get information about the whole tissue sample, and the resolution is limited by the pinhole size. So far, we've illuminated the sample by normally incident light, and we measure the scattered light behind the sample. In our lab in Jülich, we use a different approach where we reverse the light path and measure an outer ring of the scattering pattern. Uh, the setup is very simple. So we place a mask with a hole on top of an LED panel. So the sample is illuminated under a large angle. And then we take a picture of the transmitted light under normal incidence. Then we rotate the mask uh, here in steps of uh, 15 degree and take an image for each rotation angle. And in this way, we basically measure the outer ring of the scattering pattern. But we record the images of the whole sample. So here with a resolution of 6.5 microns, so we can measure a whole brain section at once with micron resolution. And this technique we call uh, scattered light imaging. And here you see the resulting line profiles for the selected regions. Uh, you see, of course, the discretization, but the profiles correspond very well to each other. And we can nicely determine the peak positions here. Here is a document that was uh, recently published in Physical uh, Review X. Um, it shows the line profiles obtained from the scattered light imaging for different regions um, in a coronal monkey brain section. In direct comparison here to uh, the simulated scattering patterns, and the line profiles here were computed along this outer circle. And you see the measured profiles correspond very well to the simulated ones. So in a region with uh, parallel in-plane fibers, such as uh, the corpus callosum, we observe two distinct peaks. And in a region with plane fibers, such as the fornix, we observe one broad peak. And in regions with in-plane crossing fibers, such as the corona radiata, um, yeah, we observe four distinct peaks, which correspond to the orientations of the fibers in the crossing region. And again, we get this information here um, with a pixel resolution of 6.5 micron. Yeah, now we evaluate the uh, measured line profiles in a bit more detail. So we first identify the position of the peaks, 
only for peaks with a certain prominence, so a small peak here is not detected. And then we compute the orientation of the pilots from the midpoint between the peaks, or when we have more than two peaks, from the midpoint between the peak pairs. And when we draw the line profiles along a circle, we can already see the transition between regions with uh, parallel fibers and uh, crossing fibers. And when we compute the fiber orientation from the peak positions, um, we can nicely see the crossing of the two fiber bundles here in green and magenta. Yeah, here the orientations were computed for each image pixel and encoded in different colors. And here you see the same for several image pixels uh, taken together. So you can nicely see the structure of the crossing fibers here. And below, um, there is a, yeah, the 3D PLI measurement I showed you in the beginning. And you can nicely see now the difference that we can use this technique here to resolve the crossing fibers we couldn't resolve with uh, 3D PLI. Um, this also works in regions with three crossing fiber bundles. So here you see the crossing angles of the three different bundles. Same again for a whole brain tissue in a vervet uh, monkey brain and in a red brain. And this close up here uh, shows again nicely the crossing fibers in the corona radiator of the vervet brain. Yeah, so uh, to conclude, with DPR slide imaging, we can reconstruct the nerve fiber orientations in the brain with microscopic resolution, but we cannot reconstruct crossing nerve fibers. In the simulation studies, we found that the scattering of the light gives information about the tissue substructure, like uh, the crossing angle. And with the scatterometry measurement, we can measure the scattering pattern of the brain tissue, but only for selected regions and with limited spatial resolution. And then I introduced a new technique called scattered light imaging, which can be a very simple setup where we eliminate the sample under a large angle and uh, the resulting line profiles correspond very well to what we get from the scatterometry. And with this technique, we can um, reconstruct nerve fiber crossings and whole brain sections with micro resolution, uh, not only for two, but uh, for several crossing bundles. And the technique can be easily combined with light imaging so we can improve the nerve fiber topography, especially in regions with crossing fibers. Yeah, most of the uh, results here are quite recent. If you would like to learn more about the simulation studies or the basic principles of scattered light imaging, you can have a look at our um, recently published article in Physical Review X and um, also in the conference uh, proceeding. Yeah, um, with this, I'd like to conclude my talk. Yeah, I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Fiber Architecture Group in Munich and Silvania Pereira um, from Delft for the collaboration, and you, of course, uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions either now or yeah, at the Q&A session at the end. Or you can also drop me an email if you have uh, further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Miriam. That was really enlightening. Um, before we go on to the next um, speaker, uh, could you maybe speak a bit about the next steps? So now you, you said this is definitely very recent results. Do you plan to apply this in scale or um, uh, or where, where do you plan to go with this? So, um, yeah, as I said, uh, these are the preliminary results, but um, of course we can also uh, use this technique now um, in our measurement routine. So this is already done and we all um, try to combine it with 3D polar light imaging so that we actually can improve the uh, interpretation of the nerve fiber orientations in the measured uh, brain regions. So we're already working on including this in the nerve fiber tractography uh, algorithms that were usually based on the data from 3D polarized light imaging, but there, of course, we have the problem with the nerve fiber crossings. So it's more that we take, um, let's say, the high resolution uh, quality 3D data from 3D polarized light imaging, and then we combine it with the data in the crossing regions, so just uh, briefly showed here in this comparison. Um, and then we can combine basically these um, results uh, yeah, to uh, improve the fiber tractography. And in the end, of course, this will also uh, be included in the brain atlas. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for that. Maybe we can dive into that in the Q and A section. I hope all the uh, um, sorry attendees will have a lot of uh, juicy questions for you later on. Uh, for now, I think we should go on to Sandra, if you are listening. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Excellent. Sandra. I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? 
Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Sandra Diaz. I uh, also work in the Forschung Center Jülich in Germany, um, but uh, I work in the Simulation Lab Neuroscience, which is part of the Jülich Supercomputing Center. And today I want to talk to you about structural plasticity in spiking neural networks and an implementation that I've worked on uh, for the NEST simulator together with an HPP plus story. So this is my, my research experience and uh, just later also in a presentation around this topic. So uh, first I want to introduce what is a structural plasticity. And um, structural plasticity refers to the ability of neural networks to actually change their structure regarding the creation or deletion of synaptic, synaptic connections. We in, tend to think about neural networks, especially spiking neural networks or uh, the ones that we commonly use in computational neuroscience, to have a fixed connectivity. And uh, we, can, we can change the strength of the connections, but it is not so common that we change the actual connections between neurons. However, structural plasticity City actually plays a, an important role in different processes like learning and memory and adaptation, and of course, during brain development. So it is an important uh, phenomenon that we should be able to model. And um, when I started my PhD, I worked in the implementation of a model uh, to describe this process inside a NEST simulator, which is um, a, a Spiking neural network simulator, which uh, abstracts neurons to, to points in space. And um, so my, my implementation, uh, I worked together with, uh, with Professor uh, Marcus Butz and uh, with uh, Michael Novo. And the concept behind it is that um, we have the neurons in the network, and then each of these neurons has is uh, synaptic elements. So synaptic elements are like, like blocks that uh, when you have two compatible synaptic elements, they can form a new synapse between them. And you can the neuron can also decide to delete su such a synaptic element, and then the synapse between the two neurons is deleted. At some point, uh, what is important is that the network is able to create to change its structure, but also to rewire itself. So, uh, for example, a synaptic element that used to exist before, but the counterpart is deleted, can be used to create a new synapse in the next um, time that the network is updated. Um, so, in this implementation, uh, it works in three steps. It's an algorithm that works in three steps. The first one, um, is related to measuring the current firing rate of the neuron. And why is this important? Well, because this model is based on a homeostatic um, activity. It, it defines that the neurons uh, will want to create more connections if they need more activity, and they will delete connections if they have too much activity. And um, this is a general principle, and of course, then we need to, to know the current firing rate of the neuron in order to guide the algorithm. So for that, in NEST, we have a calculation of the firing rate based on a, an exponential filter that gives us an approximation of the current firing rate of the neuron. And then the step number two is to update the number of synaptic elements. And that is, um, let's say, the, the, each neuron updates its, its offer to the network how many connections it can create, or how many connections it needs to delete because it has too much activity. And here in panel A, we see different examples of rules, uh, homeostatic rules that guide the, the creation of synaptic elements. So we have number of synaptic elements on the uh, y-axis and firing rate on the x-axis. And this is a special type of growth curve uh, called a Gaussian growth curve. So it has a point where uh, it crosses 
the, the axis, and that point is called the target firing rate. So the, the point of activity that the neuron actually wants to achieve. For example, a neuron maybe wants to achieve, uh, achieve a homeostatic activity of 8 hertz in this case. So in the panel B, we see if the neuron had a steady increase in, in, this, in this firing rate through the simulation time, at this point in time, it would reach this, uh, this 8 hertz. And this is how uh, the creation of synaptic elements through time, such so simulation time, would look like based on this homeostatic rule or on the four different homeostatic rules. Um, so in the end, the step number three is actually to update the network structure. And once we have the new synaptic elements ready, we can decide if we can create or delete uh, connections. And this update in the new network structure needs to be quite slower to the actual simulation uh, time step that you have in the network because it's very computational demanding. And in order to keep the efficiency of the simulations, then this is done maybe a hundred or a thousand times uh, slower than the normal simulation step. Um, so the simulation um, that I described to you and the model and implementation um, was implemented in, in NEST, as I said. And um, this, there, is, uh, there are several structures that were integrated into NEST uh, in order to achieve this. Uh, these are described in this paper here below that you can visit or read it when you're in, if you're interested. Um, but the important thing is that, in general, if you keep a slow up, update of the network, um, the, the performance of the uh, simulations is quite uh, well under the, um, the normal uh, simulation performance of NAST for networks up to 100,000 units. Of course, the problem now is, okay, we have now this great capability to create and delete synapses during simulation time, and all looks very nice. Um, and it's integrated into NAST. As you know, uh, NAST is, uh, or probably know, for those of you who don't, uh, NEST is part of eBrain. So eBrain is the uh, software infrastructure of uh, the Human Brain Project. And uh, you can find more examples on how to use the structural plasticity in the NEST documentation. And I left a link for there uh, for, for you to find uh, some information over there. Um, so the next step was, well, now I have this nice implementation of a model, so it's really nice and powerful. What can I do with it? And then I felt like this, this uh, node in a network with lots of potential to connect and do stuff with what I implemented in my research, but I had actually no synapses to other researchers or other, uh, other contacts, labs, etc. But there was the HPP uh, floating around me. And I, I said this was uh, the status, let's say, four years ago. And this is why. Um, this is the second part of, of my talk. It's more about this HBP plus story. So what happened? I had this technique and I started uh, talking to people because I wanted to visualize how the network changed through time. And I had a wonderful opportunity to work together with Juan, uh, Juan Pebrito from Madrid and their whole group. They are super, um, they have lots of uh, interesting applications for visualization of networks and we work together in an application that could help um, users of this technique visualize what was happening to happening to the network through simulation time and then i also worked uh, together with Chris, christian novke um, to make other techniques that could allow me to use even more these capabilities and to change the growth curves through time while the simulation was ongoing because I found out that actually finding a good equilibrium between the creation of inhibitory and excitatory synapses was critical and it was not easy to 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 find just by thinking about it so you actually had to run the simulations and interact with them so we created these interactives during and visualization tool 
that allowed us to also tackle problems which were more complicated, like embedding the connectivity of point neurons with coarser level uh, networks in a type of multi-scale simulation. I'm there so sorry for interrupting here, Sandra, but we have to transition to the Q&A phase in roughly a minute. Do you think you can wrap up? Uh, yes, I will run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, here's a, a, another um, nice photo and meeting that we had around structural plasticity uh, involving the neuromorphic hardware and, and related work. And um, then some more other applications of structural plasticity to study um, coordinated reset therapy and uh, stimulation. Um, some other uh, research uh, taking structural plasticity as a, an optimization algorithm for neural network connectivity. And here um, I want to, to highlight um, that we did lots of uh, simulations, uh, heavy, uh, heavily computer intensive simulations on IC resources, and uh, that was really helpful. So if you want to try that out or know more, here's a link also for the demonstrator that uses this. And there's lots of more uh, research being done around structural plasticity after all the collaborations that came to be through time. So I just wanted to show you that in the end, uh, my structural plasticity in my research actually worked quite well. I managed to create lots of nice connections with other nodes in the HBP and outside of the HBP network. And to wrap up, um, I just want to invite you to step number one, update your research activity. Step number two, grow your contact points and make them visible to the community. And step number three, update your network and the structure to create new collaborations, because this is really, really important. And I hope the education program and the HBP can help you do that as well uh, in your own niche of research. So thank you very much. And that's from my time. Thank you very much for your presentation and this nice graph. I think it, it, it neatly shows the qualities, one of the qualities of the HBP. Um, so there, were, there were a lot of questions for you in, in the talk while you were presenting, Sandra, and one of them that's by Alice uh, Dimignani, and she asks, are there other implementations of, um, of uh, structural plasticity rules? So, for instance, um, amplifying the firing rate of a neuron if it's receiving input at a certain rate and so on? Um, so there are different uh, implementations. There are others which consider um, Yes, a uh, firing rate, but um, it is measured through the synapse. So um, the problem is that um, if you if you do that, you have to have a fully connected network in order to activate or deactivate the, the synapse when this happens. And then you have the problem of growing memory when your networks really scale up a lot. Um, so this is um, a local rule, the one that we have implemented in NEST, and it is quite blind to what happens to other neurons. There are workarounds, uh, like to create common growth rules, um, but um, actually there are not so many implementations of structural plasticity. I mentioned some of them also for the neuromorphic hardware in one of my slides. They were the Spinnaker and brain skills. They were both very clever in the way that they implemented structural plasticity um, to, to put some limits uh, to the amount of synapses that you could have and to make it practically useful for uh, machine le learning tasks. So um, I, I, I welcome you to visit also the different uh, papers that I put in my, in my slides uh, because this is very interesting work. Uh, some of them are based on our implementation, some of them are independent implementations but with all of them, I've had nice and fruitful collaborations and, and discussions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, that, then there's some work to be done for um, for Alicia. Uh, Lots of work. <laughs> so there are also a couple of questions um, for you, Miriam. So uh, here are two from Carmen asking, first of all, is this technique computationally expensive? And second, are the images available in the knowledge graph? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess uh, the technique um, refers to the scattered light imaging I, I introduced, I think. So um, I this is basically, 
yeah, this is basically just a, yeah, a measurement where we where we take uh, pictures of, of the brain sections for different rotation angles. So um, computationally expensive um, when extracting the, um, the peaks. So when analyzing the data, we, we um, have to determine the peak positions. And from this, we um, uh, generate the, the FABA orientations. This can be done with a very simple uh, Python script and can also be easily parallelized. So I wouldn't say that this is a bottleneck to, to analyze the data. Of course, the data itself, depending on the resolution of the microscope, uh, has a certain uh, size. But um, yeah, it's, it's not uh, more expensive than what we already do with 3D provides light imaging. The normal measurement technique, I would say. Um, yeah, and if the images uh, are already available in the knowledge graph, so as I said, the, yeah, there's very recent measurements. So actually, uh, we're still working on publishing these results I just showed you. So um, we will definitely try to uh, include this data also in the knowledge graph and the atlas uh, at the very end. But uh, yeah, we're still under development. So I just wanted to give you a first glimpse of, of what might be possible and if you have some ideas. Very interesting. Thank you. Actually, Carmen asked a third question, um, which you might want to elaborate on. So what are uh, the results useful for? Is it useful for building connectomes or something else? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as I try to, to explain, when we have the comparison to um, 3D plus light imaging, where we're not able to actually resolve these fiber crossings, but now we can actually see inside these fiber crossings and, and get the uh, connections right. So this is a very important step. Um, yeah, not only for um, 3D plus light imaging in this uh, particular case, mm -hmm. but I would also say for um, generating fiber architectures, tractography in general, because when we have, for example, diffusion MRI uh, images, they have a much coarser resolution than what we usually achieve with our microscopes. Um, they can, of course, resolve fiber crossings, but just in the range of maybe a millimeter scale or post mortem, maybe to 100 micron. And now with the microscopes, we can uh, go down to a micron resolution. And with this new technique, we are now even able to resolve fiber crossings within an image pixel. OK, now I showed six micron, but in principle, you can also go down to a micron depending on your microscope, of course. This is just a prelimi preliminary setup that we use. Um, this is not fully automated yet. Uh, this we are still working on, but we already showed that we can use these results for this. So it will also help to improve um, let's say the interpretation of um, yeah, diffusion MRI data, for example, or to improve uh, connectivity data um, in general, I would say. Incredibly interesting. Um, so I'd love to dive into that, but I think I'll jump to the next question because we have a lot yeah. coming in the chat. So thank you for that, keep them going. Um, so Peter um, Bogdan from the University of Manchester asks uh, for you, Sandra, um, is the model of structural plasticity, uh, so the one present in the nest, also available in, in pine nests? So for those of you who don't know, pine is another modeling language to describe neural networks. So can you run this structural plasticity from pine? Yes, actually, um, it is possible. It was one of uh, the, the uh, latest things that we did together in collaboration with several groups and um, and and. Peter is uh, also one of, of part of, of one of these groups, and uh, it was not so easy to come up with a general description that could encapsulate all the requirements for structural plasticity for the platforms that Pine is able to interact with. But um, we came up with a general structure for it, and in theory, yes, you can describe your Pine uh, network and then use the Pinest interface to to have your network uh, running uh, with the structural plasticity. Perfect. So, and if I'm not doing your question justice for the for the audience, um, please feel free to add supplementary questions. Here's another one for you, Sandra. So, um, what kind of homeostatic rules are available from this? This is asked by Alper. What kind of rules? Uh, yeah, so there are uh, linear rules, so straight lines. Um, there are uh, Gaussian rules, there are sigmoidal rules, and uh, my favorite one is the Gaussian rule, actually. Um, <laughs> so you can actually implement your own rule for it, and the, the type depends, of course, on, on, the, on the shape of the curve that you define. Um, and it impacts a lot uh, the speed at which connections are created inside the network. 
So if you consider the network to be a system that you are trying to, let's say, steer or control uh, using the, the, the sign up input, then um, you can you can state that these uh, these curves act as uh, some uh, description of the controllers, and then you can have a smooth changes in the network in the structure of the network or very fast and strong uh, changes in the structure of the network. So you have to tune them to be um, what you need for your system and to, to for it to reach a steady state. Excellent. So, uh, and a final question also for you, Sandra, is this model applicable to networks with realistic morphologies as well? So not just point neurons, but more maybe compartmental. Yeah, so others. theoretically this model could be applied uh, to morphologically detailed neurons. Actually, uh, we submitted a grant uh, to, to do this uh, to the HPP. Unfortunately, it didn't go through, but it's still our hope that in, at some point we can do this for the Arbor uh, simulator. And um, here we would have uh, a lot of, uh, more of computation because we would have to decide where along the morphology of the synapse we want to grow synaptic points and then which connections should be done and how. Uh, but it's a very interesting topic and we're looking forward to uh, move with this as soon as we get some funding for the next steps of this project. Excellent. So unfortunately, our time is running out. Um, and so is the list of questions for the um, uh, presenters. So thank you so much to Miriam. Uh, thank you so much to you, Sandra, as well, for your presentation. It was very enlightening to your research um, and, and great interaction with you. You can also get a chance to reply to the community and, and some questions. So. Um, before we end, it's very important to say that this is an initiative started by the HPP Education Program. We plan to um, keep going. So the next event will be the 28th of May, uh, same time, uh, but different place, likely on Zoom. Um, the invitation link will be sent later. We still need to figure out exactly how to, uh, how to do it so we avoid any um, technical difficulties. I hope you'll all attend. Um, this has been very helpful for me, very interesting. Uh, and let's keep the conversation going. Again, thank you so much for the presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending and uh, see you soon. Bye everyone.